And there we go, everyone. We are back again for another fantastic conversation on Friday Night Counterattack. And this one is quite a special one for me on multiple reasons. The first one is because I've got a very special guest on our podcast today who speaks at the same decibel level as me. So I don't need to raise my voice over anyone else. He's just as calm and mellow as me. So we're not going to be ruining your eardrums as you're listening to this in the car on the playstation when you're doing your housework will be mellow relaxed cool calm and collected unless there's a few controversial topics or two down the line as well the second reason i'm happy about the special guest that i've got is because um for someone who's been so prominent in football media for the last 20 years in football journalism and football media from an ethnically diverse background and for someone like myself who's also from an ethnically diverse background it does mean a lot to me to have this gentleman on the podcast as well. He's been a reporter, he's been an editor, he's been a mentor, he's been a chairman, he's been so many different things over his career. I'm not going to say a cheesy line and say, but he's also my friend because we we chat, but we're not, we're not, I'm not going to say that Mr. Darren Lewis is my friend because I still revere him as like top tier in respect from my point of view as well. So introducing, even though I kind of spoiled my special guest, but you'd have seen by the title, introducing Mr. Darren Lewis. Darren, it's good to see you, my friend. How are you doing? I'm really grateful to you for having me on your podcast. I know you've been doing really well with it. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. I told everyone, I said, this is the decibel level we're at for the conversation. My my, my wife can relax. I won't be shouting the house down for the next hour or so. We will be chilled. We will be relaxed. And it's going to be a fun conversation along this journey as well. So everyone listening, make sure you listen to the end because we've got some really fun stories to tell you. I say we, it's mostly going to be Darren's stories, which will be great fun indeed. But Darren, for someone who doesn't know who you are and for what you're doing at the moment, I, I describe you as a footballing media superman because you're everywhere on every network working in a ridiculous amount of hours per week and you're actually doing so much for the football media community which is incredible to see how can you summarize what you're currently doing right now for your line of work because for me I'm just there like oh he's here again he's here again and as the young people call it I still like to consider myself a young Darren we call it side quest but you're doing it as a job which is incredible so you've got right. CNN you've got talk sport you've got sky sports you've got the journalist association as well how do you do it all well, maybe I should ask you, how would I? Is that the right way to describe it? Side quest. Side quest is like, the way I can describe it is, these are all things you would normally do on a daily basis for your job. Side quest is like, oh, you're going to have a round of golf in between going between studios or going between locations. And that's quite, that's kind of what a side quest really is. So for example, like if I've got work tomorrow and I'm going to play a round of foot golf, I play more foot golf than actual golf because... My arms are rested for cricket and for tennis. Mm -hmm. So that's more what I would consider a side quest. But the way I'd kind of describe it is you've got so much going on for you. You've got so many quests going on, general quests, main quests. How do you do it? And how have you done it for so long? Um. Well, uh, to be honest with you, I, I'm i actually driven by people like you, to be honest wow. with you. And people like so many of the, the the content creators and the influencers who have been able to change the industry uh, come into the industry and and realize that it's there for them it's there for you it's there for the people whether you're male female black white whatever your background the, 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 it's there for you and when i started in the industry it wasn't always the case but what keeps me going is making sure that people like you get in to the industry and feel comfortable in the industry as well because that's so important the game is there for all of us to enjoy um and the way that we consume it and even consume the information that comes out of it is changing all the time and that's what drives me to kind of be involved in that be a part of that enjoy that uh and, and and it's amazing. So to see you doing so well with this and to see so many people like you doing so well with their platforms, using their voices, to me, that that's the energy I need. Yeah, I appreciate it. You're making me actually well up as well. I'm going to have to have a sip of my tea in a second as well to make sure I'm staying professional in front of the ultimate professional, I would say, as well. I like that you've got your tea right there. Is it tea or coffee? What, what are you drinking today? Black coffee coffee i can't do coffee in the evenings i'll be up till three o'clock in the morning 
yeah. I shouldn't, but <laughs> that special occasion I can I can say the least, which is great. But the way I kind of see it as well is one thing that I like about our platform from our point of view is we can speak about whatever topic we want and we don't have any pushback. We'll get people commenting, but it's not really pushback from um from people. And you've been somewhat inspiring to me in a way, because you're always on national news, you're always on in the newspaper talking against the equalities of racism as well. So you talked about how we've seen that in the stand, we've seen that in the media, we've seen it from people on the pitch as well. And you've always been inspiring me in terms of talking about it so openly and so passionately at the same time, because a lot of people will look at it thinking, oh yeah, it's just another fad. It's going to go away in a couple of days, but you're always so on top of it when you're on live TV, when you're in a recorded studio, when you're talking about it with footballers as well. How have you found the response from that, from talking about racism in football to then responding to other people who have had that kind of experience as well? So as players, as fans, as coaches even as well, as people in the media, of course. How have you found the response to that, Dan? Look, the, the, the key thing about talking about racism isn't just to generate social media engagement or to go along with whatever prevailing wind there is on any given day it's to keep the door open because the door keeps closing um, and the opportunities that might arise when the industry feels a little bit guilty about itself those doors close very quickly and it's a real battle and it's it's very very difficult to 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 na navigate that terrain um because people believe mistakenly that things have changed considerably but i think for your parents for my parents that there is a there is a wider landscape that is very difficult for the way we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis so it is important to talk about those things and it's important not to be afraid to talk about those things because i think the way of social media is that when you do, people say, well, they try to browbeat you into not talking about those things. But also, I always smile a little bit to myself, not too much, but a little bit to myself when people say, you're always talking about racism. Yeah, because I'm always going to be black. Um, and there's so much... People often say when you talk about racism in football, it's a societal problem. And then when you talk about the societal problem, you say you talk about racism too much. But the it's point what we do. is that it's what we live with. It's what your parents, your friends, my friends, my parents, my children, people watching, listening here, it's what their families have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why it's important to talk about it so that we don't slip back into that complacency that we've made progress and things are better we need to be making sure that things continue to change for people that we know and even the people that we don't absolutely we've got to be there as a shining light moving forward as well and that was something that i've been really happy to learn from you from the outside looking in and something that i've been taking onto our platform here at friday night counter that because we like celebrating the differences of people the um, the 1% differences in people that people don't like to talk about is uh, why are you talking about this at this time and I'm like well actually just like you kind of said there Darren is sometimes you don't have to wait for an incident to happen to talk about racism you can talk about it in a way where you're feeling comfortable with who you're speaking to the to about as well regarding the topic so it's good that we've got this discussion out because it's a very big thing that is going to continue to plague our game plague our society but it's got to be there for people to be made aware that actually we're here to change it we're not going away and more and more people across media football media as well have been doing such a good job to educate people along the way and it's absolutely fantastic to see that for me it kind of started from seeing you on the tv talking about it that everyone now has the opportunity to say it on their platforms and say it as their own voices as well which is great so I just want to say personally for me thank you very much for that uh, it's been absolutely incredible to learn from you from the outside looking in and now I've got another couple of minutes. Well, yeah, we've got the rest of the podcast, I should say, to learn a bit more about you, about your thoughts on football that's happening this week as well. And of course, about the England national team, because the England national team is never far away from a 
an issue or two in society. And at the time of recording, they played yesterday at St. James's Park against Bosnia. And first of all, I've got to get some fan questions out of the way. So one of the fan questions we had for you, Darren, was what's your favourite interview of all time? What? Favourite interview that I've seen? That, that, I... you've, that you've participated in, that you've interviewed someone? That I've done... Um, my favorite interview um, is probably the most important interview I've done, which is with the UEFA president, Alexander Cheferin. Um And wow. it's my favorite interview because of the way it came about. Um, England had been uh, racially abused by in in Bulgaria yes yeah and, Tyron Mings Raheem Sterling and and everyone was angry about it and for the umpteenth time uh UEFA put a statement out and it didn't really strike the right tone so I decided to go out there and talk to them and so I flew out to Switzerland and without any warning um and actually this bit of the story, it's not like the hero moment because when they got there, they said that he can't talk to you. Oh, um, so I had to go back again. <laughs> um, but did well, you enjoy the chocolates at least at the airport, taking some back? Well, I'm not a chocolates man, you see, so okay, I take a few back, and I was very popular for a few days with my family. Love um, it. <laughs> but he was very true to his word, and he got in touch with me. And said, if you come back, uh, he was in Romania uh, around about 10 days later. And he said, if you come out here, I'll talk to you. Brilliant. And generally with these interviews, you get around about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. We talked for over an hour. And it was a, a really um, open, honest conversation. Um, not just about how he felt about the situation but around the difficulties as well uh some very stark home truths about england as a nation and where we were at that point um that was before the european championship in 2021 yeah and so there were some issues around that that we discussed but it was a very grown-up conversation very important conversation and to, yeah to me it it it's my favorite interview because so often when we're frustrated about the things we talk about UEFA should do this and UEFA should do that. So to have the opportunity to actually put it directly to the man in charge and for him to be so good in terms of listening and for us to find some common ground in that interview. Yeah, it was a really important one to do. Absolutely. It's really big to hear that as well, that the key term you used was common ground, understanding that two different people from two different countries, from two different backgrounds, they can understand the importance of what's actually at stake here and what needs to be done and what needs to be improved upon. So it wasn't just, oh yeah, don't come back again. It was, we can actually talk about this like adults and from the outside looking in, that's what it seems like. And that's probably why it's your favorite interview of all time that you've had so far. I'm going to try and make this one the best interview you've ever had, but from the other side, uh, which is good fun as well. One interview that I liked a lot from my point of view was your conversation with Trent Alexander-Arnold recently. I think it happened this year in February or so. You were having a conversation with him around the time of the Carabao Cup final. And I thought it was absolutely insightful to learn a bit more about him as a person, not just him as a footballer and what he really wants to achieve in his career. And I thought that was really incredible to learn because it was so much more different than your usual post-match reaction on Sky Sports or your pre-match interview with Sky Sports. And you're really learning more about the person and what makes them them in a way, which was really incredible. What was one key takeaway from that interview with Trent Alexander-Arnold that really made you kind of sit up and go, wow, I like what I'm hearing from the international, the England international from Liverpool? I think the, the belief from him, because he's had a lot of criticism, when you think about how old he is, he's still just about in his early 20s. Um, yes. And yet he's won everything there is to win in in terms of the League Cup, the FA Cup, the, uh, the Premier League and the Champions League with Liverpool. He's a local boy. He knows what it is to represent the club. He knows what the values of the club are. He empathises with the fans. He, he's a real 
poster boy for everything that Liverpool represents. And I actually don't think he gets the credit he deserves because people look at what he can't do rather than what he can do. I was going to lead to that. I love it. What, what When I even talk about what he can't do, I mean, you don't win Champions Leagues unless you're defensively very capable, which he is. But I think we within the British culture, we do like to pick holes rather than lift people up. We like to hate on people, as the kids say these days. <laughs> Sorry, I like using that term. It's because people like to call me uncle now. And I'm like, I'm not an uncle. I've just got a beard. My hair's a bit longer than usual, but I'm not an uncle. Relax, children. Um, but no, it's, it's literally like that as well, because you see that how much of an important player he is for Liverpool for the last six, seven years that he's been in the starting lineup under Jurgen Klopp. And mm. it's going to be a different feeling for him as a, as a person and as a player when Arna Slot comes in during the summer. But... Like you said, a lot of people in the media like to yeah, basically hate on players for what they can't do. You can't hate on Phil Foden for not using his right foot enough. You can't hate on Jack Grealish for not playing on the other wing uh, as frequently as he does. But you can hate on Trent Alexander-Arnold because sometimes he gets beaten in a one versus one and sometimes he leaves his back post uh, unmarked as well. But they won't praise him for his passing range. They won't, pass him for his, they won't praise him for his composure on the ball. And for me... I think it needs to change. And for me being a Manchester United fan, I know I'm wearing, wearing an Inter Milan kit here, but I'm a Manchester United fan. I can honestly say Trent is probably one of my favourite Liverpool players of all time because of the way he composes himself on the pitch and off the pitch as well. He does so much for charity. He does so much in his local community. And when you watch him play, or when I watch him play objectively, he's a fantastic ball playing defender. And he has so much showmanship about him that we really should be bigging him up even more. And how he hasn't had the, the amount of England caps that he should at this age now. He was in the squad since the 2018 World Cup and has barely played because of the likes of Carl Walker, Kieran Trippier, Reese James. I'm really happy that we're going to be seeing him in a midfield role at this European Championships. That's kind of my thoughts on it. Would you agree with that? Would you disagree? No. I would, I would. Um, one of the things that he spoke to me about was just being prepared to get onto the pitch. It didn't really matter what position he plays in. I think that if he played for one of the other big nations in world football, we'd probably give him more kudos and appreciation than we give him because they would use him very much in an attacking context rather than a defensive one. I think that they'd appreciate his ability to bomb forward, supplement attacks, deliver good crosses into the box, take opportunities on the volley like he did the other day and score spectacular goals his ability from dead ball situations as well there is so much to like about him and his distribution his game intelligence that I it, it just blows my mind that people choose to focus on defensive frailties when we've got one of the best attacking sides in the world so yeah, that if you're asking me if there is any one element of his game, I couldn't pick one out because I think he is still one of the most exciting right backs we've had in in the Premier League ever. I would agree with that, especially like you like we said earlier, he's done it from such a young age in the starting lineup week in week out, and has been so consistent in that. So it's going to be very fun to see what he performs like in the midfield role at the European Championships coming up this summer as well, which is fantastic and. One thing I need to talk to you about as well, because we are going to a different topic completely here, Darren. I've got one more fan question, but I think I'll save that for the end because it will be quite fun to, to end it. Which be, Actually, no, I'm going to use it now. It makes complete sense because we're talking about England and Trent Alexander-Arnold. What's been your favourite moment as a journalist at a major tournament for you? Oh. Not the best, but your favourite this time. Well, on the one hand, I was going to talk about... Um... Wayne Rooney exploding onto the scene at the Euros in 2004 because he really was impressive. Absolutely. But I'd have to say, I think the golden ticket very often when you go to a World Cup is if you get to see Messi, Ronaldo or, or Brazil. Yep. And uh, in 2018 in uh, St. Petersburg, I saw Messi scoring an outstanding goal um, for Argentina against Nigeria. Oh, no. 
drive. I, I I remember my friends' reactions to it. My my not my Argentinian friends. I'm not I'm not going to pretend like I've got Argentinian friends. My Nigerian friends they were very very unhappy the day after that. And I'm just like, well, what can you do? It was an incredible touch, an incredible composed finish, and it was outstanding to see on the world stage as well. But what was it like for you watching him in person at the World Cup? It was it was electrifying because for all the reasons I just said, when you go to a World Cup, you want to see the great footballers, and when you're a journalist, you want to see it the great footballers and I think there is no finer sight in football journalism than seeing one of the greats whether it's in football Messi Ronaldo uh, whether it is uh, Mbappe Haaland we have him in plain sight in this country whether it's in tennis it's Federer Djokovic Nadal whether it's horse racing it's Frankel or, or, or Constitution Hill um, boxing Tyson Fury I could go a bit further back, but you know, go on, go further back. Who do you want to add to it? Lennox Lewis, Mike, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was just raw power, skill, technique, um, like you at the gym. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I can keep going with that. Don't worry, I'm I'm a boxer myself. I've been boxing for six years now, so I, I know I know someone who's got a big, um, who's got a big forehand on him. So I'm looking forward to seeing your boxing. Later this summer, it, it's going to happen. We'll have a we'll have a boxing day out at the gym sometime. We'll have it in Sheffield HQ. It'll be fun. All I will say is that I'm not sure the heavyweight division's ever been as good as when uh, since Mike Tyson was on the rampage and doing fantastic things. Um, we say it's good, but what's we say it's bigger and better, but all there is is more money uh, yep. and a greater spotlight on it but I'm not sure the quality is as good since then. Absolutely. Now we're getting on to technical ability as well, and we're getting on to raw power. I've got to go into one of the most powerful summer signings already. We're only in June, and it's a free transfer as well. It's going from, we're going from England, we're going all the way to Paris. We're seeing Kylian Mbappe leave his nation, not just for the European Championships in Germany. He's leaving his nation to move to Spain, to Real Madrid this summer to play with the likes of Jude Bellingham, Vinicius Jr., Rodrigo, Fede Valverde, Eduardo Camavinga, Aurelien Chouameni. The list is endless. Working in football media, does that just ruin the whole day of planning when it gets gets announced and you're like, oh my God, this is our main focus. Kylian Mbappe, he's moving to Real Madrid. I've got to make sure I've booked my flights to Madrid to see his presentation. I've got to be there to see his first game. What's it been like for you looking... At this whole situation the, the interesting thing about mbappe going to real madrid is it it's never you, you go into football journalism to work um and and to witness the big stories you want you want to see the big stories you want to talk about the big stories you want to go and watch when the big players sign for the biggest clubs so from that point of view it, it, it's not an issue for me um, is it basically just another day at the office for you? Yes, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much, because that's just the way it works. I love your bluntness with that. That's, that's <laughs> absolutely classy. I love it. Um, but, you know, I, I think that everyone should be excited when superstar players become another piece in a jigsaw, an outstanding club. And I remember when Real Madrid, the the probably the last two big iterations of Real Madrid when they were absolutely outstanding. Um, one of them was uh, Raul and Ronaldo and Zidane and Beckham. Uh, Makalele, Morientes, Guti. Exactly. Guti, obviously. And, uh, another was uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, so not Brazilian Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't know why I put my fist up when I was drinking my tea. I nearly choked, for goodness sake. Um, yeah, Cristiano, my boy. Oh, my days. Gareth Bale, obviously, was in that side, wasn't he? I mean, there were just so many outstanding players in the last two iterations of Real Madrid. But this one, it, well, not but this one and this one, it goes right back to what Madrid have always wanted to do, which is collect the best players in world football and put them all into one team now obviously they don't have all of them because we have one or two outstanding performers in this country as well what if they sign trent though what if carver how retires next summer and they want to get trent that's another piece of the puzzle it's another piece of the puzzle and you know trent in that side 
because the way Trent played under prime Liverpool was when Liverpool would say, you worry about us because we're not worrying about you. And that's what he would be in that Real Madrid side as well. Fearless. Worry about them because you're just going to be overwhelmed by the first wave. And if the first wave doesn't get you, the second wave is coming from the fullbacks. And if the fullbacks don't get you, they'll get you through the middle as well. So it's a real combination of flair, skill, power, consistency, and goal scoring potential. And that's like me at five aside, literally. <laughs> well, it's part of the reason as well. You know, you haven't even mentioned Alfonso Davis, who's going to go there on a free transfer to Canadian left back. Is, is that same. confirmed? Is, it, is this an exclusive? Yeah. No, no, it's not confirmed. But the, the belief is that that will be the case. Okay. He will go there and um, tear up. Well, exactly. Because <laughs> at the moment, I think that might be if they do have a weakness, if they do have a weakness, it might be there. Um, and we saw that Dortmund were able to take advantage of that in the Champions League final, but just couldn't take their chances. But if they were to get somebody like Davis to address that, then they're in a really good position, even better than they are at the moment. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at this team and the player I'm going to talk about next, and it's just someone that I've been really, really pleased with, is Jude Bellingham. But before we get on to Jude Bellingham, from a from a business point of view, I just need to say, from PSG allegedly not allowing Kylian Mbappe to play, which is what has come out and said today as well at the time of recording, that Luis Enrique and Campos were the kind of guys that allowed him to play and um, the president of PSG didn't allow him to play. And it was very, very difficult it's very, very bad business to hear that. And also over the last couple of years, letting Neymar leave on a free, Lionel Messi leave on a free, and now Kylian Mbappe leave on a free. That's a lot of money spent for free of the best players in this generation from an attacking point of view to then just go to three different places around Europe. I don't know where PSG recover from this. They can recover financially because they're state-owned, so it's not a problem at all. But their reputation must be going down the drain now after Kylian yeah, Mbappe I, I, said that publicly. I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I think that... Oh, okay. Just to go back um, to what you said a second ago, th their strength ultimately became their weakness yeah. because they had that financial power to be able to keep those players at the club. But when they wanted, certainly in terms of Neymar and Messi, when it became clear that those players wanted to go, they couldn't sell them because no one else could afford their wages. That's so true. That, that's what I mean about that strength becoming their weakness. Um, but do I think it's a necessarily a bad thing? You might hit me over the head for saying this, but I don't actually, because now the emphasis might be on PSG to build a team rather than relying on three big players and then ultimately one big player to keep delivering for them. Now they can actually start to build from the back and it might well be that they do better with a team that doesn't have those superstars in them rather than building a house made of sand and, and just relying on Mbappe to dig them out of trouble. Because obviously, as we've seen, when teams drop deep, double mark, sometimes triple mark, and keep them out of the game, there isn't very much that they can do. Well, that, that seems ridiculous about a side that got to the semi-final of the Champions League. But they are not a team like Real Madrid where they have multiple points of attack or Manchester City who if you keep Haaland quiet Foden will score if you keep Foden quiet Bernardo Silva will score if you keep him quiet De Bruyne will score there are so many different players who can hurt you with consistency I don't see that consistency with PSG but it might well be now that certainly defensively they're better and then in terms of getting those points of attack they're better as well absolutely especially when their main challenges across the season come in the Champions League and the new format of the Champions League will be a lot more challenging than the group stages that we've seen previously. Oh, currently, I should still say, because it's still technically the same season. But that's going to be a fun topic of conversation to learn about how Luis Enrique and Campos build over the summer with this newfound freedom of having an Mbappé-less. Two Mbappés have left PSG, which I find quite funny as well. They didn't want to keep the younger brother, Ethan. He had to leave as well. So that's going to be a fun change in Paris and in uh, League 1 especially as well, which would be fantastic. Yeah, I did want to ask you about Jude Bellingham. I need to ask you about Jude. I, I can't not ask you about Jude Bellingham after they won the Champions League and he won the league and 
that heartwarming interview on TNT Sports with his mum next to him taking a photo with Jose Mourinho. For me, that signifies the importance of, for me, British football, of how important it is to have a hero like that for young people to look up to, for people to be inspired by as well, at all ages, to be honest, because even I was looking at that thinking, you know what, that's what everyone wants to be. They want to be a winner. They want to be a family man and they want to show the world that they can actually do it. And surprisingly, there were some people who were quite negative towards it on, online, but on the, from the media, the mainstream media point of view, I thought it was absolutely incredible the way that they've all supported him from his journey at Birmingham City to Borussia Dortmund to the England national team to Real Madrid and then to becoming basically winning three trophies this season as well. What's your thoughts on Jude Bellingham this season? Is it like everyone else or have you got a certain angle that you think, you know what, no one's really seen it from this point of view yet? Well, I spoke to him two years ah. ago in an interview for CNN uh, and I found him at the time. I mean, when you consider he was 20, isn't he? He was 18 at the time. And he's one of the most impressive footballers I've ever interviewed. Uh, in fact, I probably would go as far as to say he is the most impressive footballer I've ever interviewed. Big statement. I love it. Only because of his age. Yeah. I, I, mean, I do remember um, being part of a media scrum listening to Gary Neville at the 2006 World Cup. And I remember by the end of the interview, I thought I could play for England. Because <laughs> just Gary's obviously an outstanding orator and he combines passion with desire and and and, and managed to get superb messages out but before we move on what position would you play for england what's your position in football what would i play for england yeah I would be a center half that's cool i play center back as well so we'll have a good partnership there if i make it into the squad as well which would be fantastic Absolutely. lewis and kobadi at the back oh that will look cold at the back it will look cold sorry carry on with what you were saying Bellingham's a fantastic young man. Uh, he's been superbly brought up. Uh, spoke to him at length for CNN a couple of years ago, as I say. Went up to Dortmund and did the interview. Afterwards, we sat and we chatted. And, yeah, I mean, there is so much that I can't tell you about the interview, all about what we chatted about. All I can say is that he is somebody who I see as a future England captain. That's how highly I rate him. His first season, he's scored 15 league goals, uh, 23 in all competitions for Real Madrid. He scored the decisive goal in two Clásicos against Barcelona. Um, he's won the the Liga title and he's won the Champions League. He's just had a, a, a magnificent season, but it's a continuation of what he's done before. And you and I, we've seen lots of players get hyped up, then get bought for big money and let you down. Yep. Well, he hasn't done that at all. In fact, you're quite excited about A, what he's going to do in the England team and B, what he's going to do next season with Mbappe on the left, maybe Vinicius in the full stein, Rodrigo on the right-hand side as well. Bellingham's just a brilliant player. And the one thing, and I'd be interested to, to ask you this because I've been arguing with some friends about where he would play. Me, I would love to see him in the number 10 position, forming an understanding with Harry Kane, like the one that Kevin De Bruyne has with Erling Haaland. But there are other people, friends of mine, who believe that Cole Palmer should play in the 10 mm. and that Bellingham should play at number eight. What do you think? For me, the way I've planned it is, I've got, I've got two ways of thinking about this, but they all relate to Harry Kane being the number nine, Jude Bellingham being the number 10, Bakayo Saka on the right or Cole Palmer on the right and then Phil Foden or Anthony Ward on the left. For me, Bellingham as a number 10 is non-negotiable, mostly because I want to see a player we spoke about earlier, Trent Alexander-Arnold, thrive in this England team. I want to see him as a number 8. Like, again, we've seen him all this season for England because people forget that we've had qualification games as well and has also done it in international friendlies against Australia, against Bosnia, and they were in rotated teams as well. So I'd like to see Trent Alexander-Arnold behind Jude Bellingham and Declan Rice also in that midfield as well. I want to be biased and put Kobe Maynard in there, but I don't want to be another Man United fan who then throws an England player, who's also a Man United player, into the fire straight away because we've seen that from time and time again. A Man United player who gets hounded by the media for maybe having an under-par performance and it gets really, really annoying and really stale for Man United fans. But I, I, I would have Kobe on the bench and maybe yeah. if he could come on in for 20 minutes in maybe one of the games where there is no pressure, maybe. He's a fantastic player. But one of the big problems we have with England 
is that when we have good players, we try to shoehorn them all into the same side. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's what happened with Lampard and Gerrard. It and Scholes. Anybody can ex accept that maybe you could just have a brilliant bench like the French did, the Spanish did, the Brazilians did. We kind of saw it as a failing of any England manager that couldn't get them all into the first 11, which was lunacy. And so I hope that common sense does prevail this time around. And Maynard gets a chance. He's just allowed to bide his time and fulfil his potential very slowly in the right way. No pressure for Kobe Maynard, but I think for me, a midfield three of Declan Rice, Jude Bellingham and Trent Alexander-Arnold, for me, that would be a dream to see at the European Championships. And one problem that England have had all the time is going for the kill in these international tournaments. And like you said, if we've got the right players on the pitch at the right time, we can continue going for the kill and have wave after wave of a team that Bellingham's going to be in with his relentless mentality of always trying to score and assist with Trent's mentality of always trying to create chances and maybe even shoot from outrageous positions that you wouldn't really see in international football and Declan Rice who's actually a lot better now at set pieces and can always score from a set piece so that midfield for me I think would be more than enough to challenge the elites of European football this summer that's my point of view but it's a fun topic of conversation because Cole Palmer is absolutely fantastic and we don't want to be like you said a team that has an embarrassment of riches but we're trying to fit them all in and cram them all in and then no one really gets to shine in that way. And we've seen that from tournament after tournament after tournament as well, uh, which is the case. And moving on to our final topic here, Darren, is someone who doesn't mind letting all the superstars play because he gives them a lot more freedom with his laissez-faire management. Someone who I literally wrote about in one of my university papers and I've got my cousin, his autobiography, as a wedding gift because I thought, you know what? He needs to learn a bit more about Mr. Carlo Ancelotti, the five-time Champions League winner for two clubs who's won the league in five different countries. What's your thoughts on Carlo Ancelotti, one of the greatest managers of our generation, who's been doing it for so many years, across so many decades, with so many different iconic teams. What's your thoughts on Carlo Ancelotti this season? Well, remember, people forget that he'd won the Champions League twice as a player as well, so which means he's won seven Champions Leagues. Mm. He'd already been the, become the first man to win it four times before this Champions League victory with Real Madrid. Now that he's won it again, he's definitely in the Hall of Fame. And there are lots of people who look at what he's done and says, well, I could win the Champions League with Real Madrid. Real Madrid are inevitable. And they forget that they went 32 years without winning the Champions League. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, between 2004 and 2011, they didn't get further than the quarterfinals. Yeah. They're a difficult club to manage. It's very, very difficult to manage a squad of players that are big personalities, big talents, massive egos. But he does it so effortlessly with so little fanfare, so little fuss. You very seldom hear of players falling out with Carlo Ancelotti. He always gets his tactics spot on. The Carlo Ancelotti sh shouting and screaming would be him raising an eyebrow that's how laid back he is and he has that respect from inside the dressing room that enables them after they've won a champions league to think to themselves let's go again if you saw the picture of Vinicius Junior saying look Tony Cruz has won six of these so we've got to get a move on and win another one and there was a wonderful banner wasn't there yeah. of uh, a squad that that or the team that they've put together and the average age is something like 23 or 24 so there is a lot more winning in that Real Madrid side to do. And given that Carlo Ancelotti is only 64, you suspect there's another two or three Champions Leagues in him before, before he were to leave. I would imagine they'd be talking about a new contract for him already. And once they get that side, they can go and uh, rinse the Champions League out again. In a different format entirely, once again, like Real Madrid tend to do. And you're looking at the teams that he's managed over the years and the way that he can still continue out for a couple more seasons as well. It's going to be absolutely fantastic and a pleasure really to see what he can do because a lot of people like to say, oh yeah, it's very greedy of them. But if they've got the facilities and the capabilities to do that, you would want to do that. You wouldn't want to get that heritage of always building year in, year out. The 2022 Champions League final, everyone wrote off Real Madrid because of how they always got through in a clutch performance against Manchester City, clutch performance against PSG. 
the, 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 this is the thing to bear in mind. Everyone says they've got all the money in the players. Well, PSG had all the money and they've never won the Champions League. Absolutely. City had all the money, but they really, they, they struggled until 2021 when they finally, sorry, 2022, 2022? Uh, when they 2021, finally, yeah, you're right. Um, and I think as far as that, 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 there was a misconception that if you have all the money, then it's easy. But we've seen in football history and even in recent football history, lots of clubs with lots of money, with big players who are unable to put together a team all buying into the same philosophy, all disciplined enough to put the team first and themselves second. Um, it's harder than it looks and Ancelotti makes it look easy. Absolutely. And when you've been doing it for so many years as well, when he was once the manager of Parma, he nearly got them to become the champions of Serie A. And it was incredible to see him with a younger team with like the likes of Gianluigi Buffon, Lilian Turam, Fabio Cannavaro, Hernan Crespo, some incredible players in Italian football and world football that he did it with younger teams. And he's been doing it for so many years with younger teams. We can talk about the AC Milan team that won in 2003. Andrei Shevchenko, you had Rui Costa, Andrea Perlo, Clarence Seydorf, some iconic names. And even like you mentioned earlier as well, Darren, the 2014 win for Real Madrid with Cristiano Ronaldo, Gareth Bale in his first season in Spanish football, Sergio Ramos scoring the equaliser in added time in the Stadio de Luz, the Stadium of Light in Portugal. Incredible moments for Carlo Ancelotti and it goes to show that a lot of people just need to appreciate I don't think people do that enough. Maybe it's just the way I see it in our country. A lot of people don't appreciate a lot of these players and managers when they are actually here. People probably do it more with managers than players. They appreciate them more when they're here. But for me, it needs to be said that Carlo Ancelotti will go down as one of the greatest managers of all time. And the fact that he's been doing it for so many years in different countries and can continue to work in different countries goes to show how popular he really is in world football, which is absolutely insane. Because it reminds me a bit about you, Darren. You're very popular in world football as well, which is great to see as well. You thought you were going to get away with another one, but nah, I needed to throw one in there as well, which is great. Um, we're coming to the end of the podcast. Before I say my thank yous and all of the pleasantries, I've got three questions for you. These are just from me. All European Championship related. So you've got to, you've got to tell me who's going to be the top scorer of the Euros, who's going to win the Euros, and who's going to be the best player of the Euros. So we'll start with Darren. Who's going to be the top scorer of the European Championships this summer in Germany? Well, um, there are some really good contenders. Skamaka's had a fantastic season for Italy. Um, Gakpo hasn't been outstanding for Liverpool, but when he's in that Holland side, he seems to to really find himself. Um, Mbappe is obviously Mbappe. We know that he's, he's, he's going to be terrific and he's got a good defensive base behind him. I think even though Liverpool, England haven't, okay, even Liverpool. though England haven't got that great defensive base, I still... You're going to say, gonna aren't you? I'm going to go for Kane. I don't have a tone. I'm going to go <laughs> for Kane because um, he's won a World Cup Golden Boot. And I remember being in a press conference at the, what World Cup was it? 2018? I think it was the 2018 World Cup. And I remember being in a press conference where he gave his an interview ahead of the first game of the tournament. And he talked about targeting the Golden Boot. And there were loads of people on social media having a laugh at that. But he went on to win that tournament's Golden Boot. He's always in amongst it. He came off. Uh, against Bosnia the other day and grabbed a goal late on and he is just the guy who's in the right place at the right time so I can see a set of circumstances where he is challenging and probably will win the golden boot with Harry Kane as well like you mentioned he's not had the best of defenses around him but that's also been the case in his club this season as well Borussia Dortmund were incredible in the Champions League and so were Bayern Munich as well but the difference between Borussia Dortmund in the Champions League and Bayern Munich was their defence. When you think about it, Hummels and Schlotterbeck were incredible. Emre Chan was incredible in the midfield. Marcel Sabitzer was everywhere. He was actually, I think, on loan from uh, Bayern Munich. But when you're looking at Bayern Munich with Kim Min Jae, Eric Dyer, Deo Upamecano, there were some frailties in that defence in the middle of the park. And uh, Joshua Kimmich had to be moved out to right back. And you had to look at uh, Conrad Leimer, Leon Goretzka, 
Alexander Pavlovich. They weren't as solid as we've seen in recent years at Bayern Munich. And that's where their frailties kind of lied in European football. But of course, in the Bundesliga, where they've lost the league title for the first time since 2012 or 13, if I remember correctly, against Borussia Dortmund. So that's kind of what I have confidence in Harry Kane for as well. Next question. Who's going to be the best player at Euro 2024 for you? Right now, this is a different question altogether. It doesn't have to be your favourite. It can be the best. Who's going to be numero uno? I only know how to say number one in Spanish for some reason. I should really know how to say it in different languages by now. <laughs> uno. Um, well, I, I, sometimes, very often, in major tournaments, the best player of the tournament isn't necessarily on the best team. In other words, because sometimes to win a tournament, you don't play brilliant football. You just have to find a way to win. Absolutely. To, to get to the, the title. Uh, and I'm going through some of the teams in my head. Um, and I've got some this. here as well. Portugal, Belgium, Netherlands, France, England, Italy, Spain, Germany, of course, the host. I mean, I was thinking about Portugal. Portugal have got some outstanding players. Take it, and I know Ronaldo's going to be there. And what can you not say about Ronaldo? He's magnificent, as we all know. You can say some more. I don't mind if you want to say more about Cristiano yeah. Ronaldo at all. Well, no, listen, the first player to score, to be the top scorer in four different leagues, I think it is. He's, he's, he's been outstanding. Longevity's outstanding. Um, but they did win Euro 2016 when he wasn't on the pitch. So they can win without him. And there yep. are some very good players in that squad um, and I wonder if even one of the senior players in that squad but like a Bernardo Silva might end up being one of the best players uh, because they do have that quality uh, particularly in that final third now so I'm going to go with Bernardo Silva Nice, I like that choice as well they've got a somewhat easy group on paper but I know from my Georgian friends and from my Turkish friends as well not to write off the other teams in the group because there will be some challenges for Portugal in this European Championship so Bernardo Silva player of the tournament prediction for you and finally who's going to win Euro 2024? I can't see past England I really oh. can't. and I know that could be a mistake because Germany under Julian Nagelsmann they look better a lot better gone back to a back four they're playing players in their off block position uh Cruz it's his final tournament for Germany Havertz is off the back of a fantastic uh Premier League season uh Gnabry is is being fantastic Leroy Sane as well those two on the wings are going to cause a lot of trouble for a lot of defenses and Rudiger at the back as well is a fantastic leader what on earth were Chelsea doing um, not giving him the contract he's needed. He's obviously since left and had a fantastic time. Um, Another Champions League for him this season as well. And they have they bought seven centre-backs in the process of trying to replace Christensen and Rudiger as well, which is insane. But And, and the reason why it, I, I am worried about Germany is because host nations invariably tend to have a good run in these tournaments. As we know, having gone to the final in 2021 but i just think england it's this is their year they've got the most fearsome attacking lineup in my that i've ever seen and i've seen some bad england teams i've seen <laughs> good england teams that they couldn't make work um and I, I look at this england team and it will score goals it will cause problems um and I think as long as they can find a defensive formation to a defensive formation, a defensive lineup to keep the back door shut, I think I'm going to go with England. Nice. Wonderful. I'll be listening to this bit of the podcast when we're on the 14th of July at around 11 p.m. after we win on penalty shootouts against Germany in Berlin. And I'll be like, I'm going to listen to that bit specifically when Darren Lewis said we're going to win the Euros because it might be coming home and it will be coming home because now you've confirmed it on our podcast. So it's official, it's an exclusive. You're, you're breaking it like this as well, which is fantastic. So yeah, what a conversation. What a lovely way of having a midweek conversation with someone who's so knowledgeable about football 
And I'm not just talking about myself here. I'm talking about, obviously, yourself, Mr. Darren Lewis as well. So before we wrap up, I just need to say personally, thank you very much for your time and for your efforts and for your your conversation. Absolutely wonderful to have you, an absolute gentleman as well. Do you have any closing messages for anyone who's listening? And my question to you before we wrap up is, what's your plan for the summer? Are you going to be going to Germany? Are you going to be going to the Olympic Games? Are you going to be reporting on the front line of a lot of these European tournaments and international tournaments? I'm going to go to uh, Germany, then I'll have a break. And then I'll obviously get ready for the new season. Uh, nice. It's going to be probably one of the most competitive Premier League seasons we've ever had. And there all the other competitions around it means that it's a, a big big sort of 10 12 months to come so um yeah i'm going to enjoy the euros first of all uh and hopefully you and everyone who's watching your podcast will do as well thank you very much i appreciate it i'm sure our audience definitely appreciates it as well but is your break going to be in paris by any chance you're not going to be hopping over to the olympics or anything just to watch the french national team or maybe Lionel messi play again for argentina this summer no, that's all good. Just in case, just in case. But everyone, th <laughs> somewhere else entirely. I'll find out where we're going later that summer as well. I say we, like I'm going to join you, but yeah, where we're going to go later this summer, which will be fun. But everyone, thank you very much for listening. A pleasure as always. Thank you for checking out our new content on YouTube and thank you for sticking with us across the season. We've got some more content lined up, which is going to be absolutely incredible. I'm not really sure how I'm going to top this because mostly, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, my decibel levels don't have to rise beside behind. My decibel de levels don't have to be high at all. So I've been absolutely fine with this conversation. I've been at my mellow pace. Hopefully you have had to turn your car audios up as well. And we've had a fun time conversing about football with Mr. Darren Lewis. So everyone, thank you very much for your time. Take care. Darren Lewis, a pleasure as always. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.